Hello, friends. Would you like to hear an amazing fact? The tallest statue in the world is now in Western India, and it's 600 feet tall, four times taller than the Statue of Liberty. It was designed after one of the founding fathers of India, Siddhar Patel, and the idea was to help bring the country together. It's called the Statue of Unity, and it's four times taller than the Statue of Liberty. It can be seen from 20 miles away, and you know, the Bible tells us that uh, there's going to be a big image in the last days. Stay with us. We're going to discuss this more in this edition of Revelation Now. Good morning, friends, and welcome again to Revelation Now. Everything is about to change. We'd like to welcome those who are joining us across the country and around the world for this very special Sabbath morning presentation. Today, our presentation is entitled Bowing to the Beast, and it's sort of part one of a two-part series dealing with this power spoken of in Revelation as the Beast. We'll be talking about the mark of the beast this evening, so a very important presentation. I'd like to remind you, if you'd like to watch this in Spanish, you can just go to the Amazing Facts uh, AF Latino Facebook page or the YouTube channel. You can also find it at the Revelation Now Spanish website. Also at the Revelation Now website, we do have signing for the deaf. So if that's going to be of help to you, make sure that you check it out. Now, we'd like to thank those who have contacted us from around the world, telling us that you're there and you're watching we just got an email from some folks in Japan, and they say they tune in and they watch the program as well as Bulgaria. So we'd like to greet those watching in Japan and Bulgaria. We also had a, an email from Janet in South Africa. She says, we have been tuning in faithfully and have been very blessed by these messages. Uh, Lynn from Switzerland says, we are praising God for this series. Thank you so much. And then Jamie from uh, California uh, she is actually hosting a Zoom party there in Merino Valley, California. And she says, we're enjoying these presentations and are looking forward to the upcoming lessons. And I think you see a picture of them on the screen. We'd like to greet those there that are watching on uh, Jamie's um, Zoom party on that connection there. So again, welcome. Thank you for being a part of this series. As mentioned, very important presentation this morning. Following the presentation, we will be taking your Bible questions as we normally do. So uh, if you have a Bible question, you can just type it in the comment section on Facebook. We have a lesson that goes along with our presentation this morning. It's entitled Bowing to the Beast. It's the same title actually as the presentation and you can download this for free at the Revelation Now website. Just Revelation Now, click on the link that says Resources, and you'll be able to download that. Our free offer is a study guide in our Amazing Facts study guide series. It says, Who is the Antichrist? That's the title. I'd like to invite Pastor Doug to come forward, and I'm going to try and give you as much time, Pastor Doug, as possible, a very important, deep, prophetic subject today, and I've been looking forward to this, and I know many of those who are watching have also been looking forward to this study this morning, so let's start with prayer. Amen. Dear Lord, again, we are so grateful that we're able to gather together and open up your word and, and talk about these end-time issues, and it seems as though... Bible prophecy is being fulfilled as we look at what's happening in the world today. So we do pray for your spirit to guide us and give us understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ross. And so that is our title, Bowing to the Beast, for today's study. But when you talk about the beast or the mark of the beast, we decided go out on the street. I thought it'd be fun to find out what do some of our average citizens out there in America have to say about this subject. Who or what is the Antichrist? Um, to me, that is Satan himself or anybody who follows his teachings and his beliefs. The Antichrist is Satan, the father of lies. Uh, the Antichrist is a group of people who uh, like, either don't believe in God or like misbehave towards him. I guess the Antichrist is just, I don't know, the opposite of 
I don't know, it's like evil, I suppose. I don't think we should be looking to one individual as the Antichrist, but I think it's a spirit of Antichrist. You got the one worldwide system, which we are fastly approaching up on this one worldwide system, uh, the Antichrist system. Uh, you won't be able to buy, sell, or eat, or do anything unless you take on them all. But I believe God always take care of his people. I believe God will have an underground railroad system where his people are taken care of. All right, well, we've got some interesting ideas out there about what the beast is and what the Antichrist is. We're gonna go to the Bible. And as always, we think it's a good idea to look at the stories in the Bible to understand what the theology and the teachings are. The story we're going to consider, you find in the book of Daniel. And some of you remember when we studied Daniel chapter 2, and Daniel uh, was interpreting the dream for King Nebuchadnezzar of this tall image that outlined the major empires of the world from the time of Daniel until the Lord returns and sets up his kingdom. And he said that the head of gold represented King Nebuchadnezzar. But then the king didn't like so much when Daniel continued with the interpretation. And he spoke about the arms of silver. And he said, after thee shall arise another kingdom. And Nebuchadnezzar liked being the head of gold. He did not like the idea that his kingdom would not last. So he began to think, if Babylon is symbolized by the head of gold, what if I make an image something like the one I saw in my dream, but make it all gold? Maybe I can overthrow or confound the vision so that Babylon will last forever. And I don't know, maybe some of his wise men or astrologers or sorcerers gave him this idea, but that's what he did. He made a massive statue on the plains of Dura there in Babylon, and he hoped to bring his whole empire together through common worship because he had all these different cultures and religions and nations so he set up this tall image of gold, and the Bible tells us that this image is 60 cubits by 6 cubits, and a number of Hebrew scholars say that if in Hebrew dimensions, if they give you the width and they don't give you the depth, the depth will be the same as the width, which means it was 60 by 6 by 6, which I think is uh, very interesting. Then he gave a command. He said, when you hear the sound of the music... They were going to unveil this majestic image and there would be glinting in the, the rising sun. Everybody was to fall down and worship it. But uh, that created a problem for three of the Hebrews that were in the king's cabinet because there is a commandment that specifically says do not bow down to graven images. It's called idolatry. Well, the king knew that some might resist. He said whoever does not fall down and worship the same hour he will be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And the furnace they had used to smelt the golden image was not far away and probably still smoldering. So they played the music. And uh, those three brave Hebrews, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, sometimes known as Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, the same individuals, would not bow down. When the king heard, some advisors said, you realize that there's some people that don't observe your law. And they're not bowing down to the image that you've set up. And the king said, bring them here. They're done for. When he saw it was these three bright, good-looking Hebrew young men that he had said in chapter 1 were ten times wiser than his wise men, he didn't want to execute them. He thought, I'll give them another chance. He said, maybe you didn't hear the command. Maybe you didn't understand. I know Chaldean's a second language for you, and I'll play the music again. See, the devil wants nothing more than for us to compromise. He'll give us a few chances to compromise. But they gave a very courageous answer. And they said, you don't need to play the music again because we understood and we're not bowing down. And he said, be it known unto thee, O king. And one of the young men answered, it doesn't say which one, that we will not serve thy gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Well, when the king heard this, he, uh, he just about blew a gasket. He commanded the, the uh, soldiers to heat up the furnace, but not just heat it up, to heat it up seven times hotter than it had ever been heated before. Then he got the strongest soldiers in his empire, and he had them tie up, didn't even strip off their clothes, just had them wrap them up in a cocoon of rope and uh, said, toss them into the middle of this raging inferno. 
Now, the Bible tells us that the furnace really was heated seven times hotter than it should have been heated because as the soldiers ran forward to throw them in, you got two soldiers, they grab hold of the, the arms and legs of Shadrach and they run up, they heave them in, the fire was so hot it killed the soldiers that threw them in. Can you imagine being the second group of soldiers? Nebuchadnezzar says, next one. And they go, oh, this is, this is a tough job. But they obeyed the king. They ran up to throw them in and they landed in the middle of the furnace, but the soldiers died in the process. I would have been very discouraged if I was the third pair of soldiers that had to throw in Mishael or Azariah. But they obeyed the king. They went and they threw uh, Azariah into the middle and they died. You know, it's interesting. The Egyptians had followed the children of Israel across the Red Sea. God performed a miracle to deliver them, but that same miracle destroyed the enemy. The Bible says that the lions that did not eat Daniel did eat the accusers of Daniel. It's interesting how God sometimes uh, evens things out during these stories of miracles and judgment. But then the king looked, says the men were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. They didn't fall near the edge. And if you wonder if it was really hot, it's not like these fires that some Vigians walk over to, to uh, do a trick. This fire was so hot it killed the soldiers that threw them in. But then the king looked and he said, did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? His advisor said, that's true, O king. He said, what's going on? I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire. And the form of the fourth is like the son of God. Now, friends, you may go through fiery trials for not worshiping the beast in the image in the last days, but God promises in those fiery trials, Jesus will be with us. I think that Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah read the promise in Isaiah when God said, when you go through the fire, I will be with you. And Jesus really did go into the fire with them and he protected them. And the only thing burned was the ropes that bound them. And King Nebuchadnezzar said, come forth, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He said, um, there's no God like this. And the king issued a decree that no one should speak against Jehovah. See, the Lord accomplished through Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego on the plains of Dura that day, what he had been wanting to do through the Hebrew nation for about 1,800 years. He got them to finally stand up and be a witness to the other nations of the power of Jehovah. And he's going to want a people that will do the same thing in the last days, that we will stand for the law of God when everybody else bows down. And look at their courage. When that music played and everyone else around them bowed, they realized they were going to be party poopers. They realized it was going to upset the king. They knew they might lose their job and lose their lives. They could have said, well, let's just tie our shoes right now, adjust our sandals, and we won't really pray to the image, but let's not make a spectacle. They stood tall when everyone else bowed down. They would not even look like they were compromising. God needs people like this in the last days that will stand for the commandments, regardless of what the majority is doing. So with that little background, we're going to start going into our questions. And the first question is, how does our story relate to Daniel in Daniel uh, chapter 3, relate to Revelation? Well, let's go to Revelation chapter 13. This is where you find the passage about the beast and the mark of the beast. And I'm going to read most of this. Just follow along. And I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads names of blasphemy. Now the beast that I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it had been mortally wounded, and its deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered and followed the beast, so that they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and it was given him authority to continue for 42 months. There's a time period that's given here. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. 
and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with a sword must be killed with a sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and it had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. Okay, right away I want you to notice something. When we talk about the last day beast, there's actually two beasts in Revelation 13. So you really need to say the mark of the beasts in one sense, because there's really two beasts that are at play here. And you know, maybe I'll stop right here. I'll, I'll tell you what this represents. Then I'll, I'll go back and uh, I'll spend some more time explaining it. Now, Paul says in the Bible, am I your enemy if I tell you the truth? Uh, I'm going to talk about some tough things today that may not be popular. And just about everybody's going to be impacted in one way or another. Uh, revelation in these prophecies talk about primary last day religions. To receive today's free offer, simply call our toll-free number 1-877-721-3800 and ask for the free offer displayed on your screen. Or you can email us, contact at amazingfactsministries.com. So we're going to go through our questions and find out what the Bible says. Question number one. How does our story in Daniel 3 relate to Revelation? As many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, does this mean in the last days that there's going to be a great big statue everyone is going to be told to pray to? No, not necessarily. Remember, there's symbols that are used in Revelation. You come tonight, we'll be talking more about that. But it's all about worship. Notice something else that um, you have in Genesis, two brothers, Cain and Abel, they both worship. One worships correctly. One worships with man-made worship, his own idea. One is worshiping, looking to grace. One is worshiping his own works. The one who is worshiping wrong kills or persecutes the one who is worshiping right. That same scenario plays out in the last days. What are the three angels' messages of Revelation 14? Now, if you have your Bibles, you turn with me to Revelation 14, and I'll tell you why it's so important to look at this. Right after Revelation 13, when it talks about the beast, the mark of the beast, and the number of the beast that we haven't gotten to yet, you go to chapter 14 in Revelation, and you'll notice that it talks about, oh, for instance, if you look in Revelation 14, and you can see... Um, it tells us here about verse 14, I looked and behold a white cloud and on the cloud one sat like the son of man having on his head a golden crown. So here we have a picture of Jesus coming. But before Jesus comes, starting with verse six, it tells us that there's these angels that take a particular message to the world calling people to return to God and avoid worshiping the beast in his image. So this is the message that is actually going out now. We want to look at these three angel messages that you find in Revelation 14. First one, Revelation 14, 7. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. We had a study earlier this week that helped us realize we're entering that last phase in the plan of salvation where there is a heavenly judgment taking place. Before Christ comes, some investigation takes place because Revelation says, Behold, I come and my reward is with me. So in order to give out his reward when he comes, there must be a judgment before he comes. And it says, Worship him that made heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of waters. So notice, this is an excerpt from the fourth commandment where it says, For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And so, it's a reminder to go back to the God of creation in a world that largely believes now evolution. And so it's a message also to remember the Sabbath. That commandment, God says, remember, has been forgotten by most Christian churches. So there'll be a revival of primitive Christianity that's going to take place again in the last days. And it's a global message. It's a message of worship. So you've got the contrast of those who worship God 
and the remembering, the Sabbath commandment, with those who worship the beast and the laws of the beast. So once again, in Revelation, it's about who do we worship. True or false worship is the issue that's at stake here. In the Sabbath commandment, here's a quote of it, Exodus 20, verse 8, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, and he rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it, made it holy. There'll be a return among the people of God to recognize and respect the things that God has pronounced to be holy. And then you go on now to the third angel's, our second angel's message. It says there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. I was in the studio the day we took the picture of this model. We dressed up a model like the Babylon whore you see in uh, Revelation 17. And I felt so bad she was a good Christian girl. and <laughs> We had to dress her up that way to get these pictures. But it depicts what you see in Revelation 17. Babylon, the mother of harlots, is sort of the conglomeration of counterfeit religion that you see in the last days. And we'll talk more about that. We have a whole lesson on chapter 17 of Revelation. So it's a warning about Babylon, this counterfeit religion, and God's people are being called out of Babylon. And then the third angel's message, if any man worships the beast in his image and receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same will drink of the wine of the wrath of God that is poured out without cup in the, uh, poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. It's the most fearful curse in the Bible is here in chapter 14 that comes upon those who worship the beast in its image and receive his mark. And so we need to know what these things are, friends, because God is telling us it can be a major deception in the last days and it will all look like it's really worshiping Christ, but it's going to be counterfeit worship. What happens immediately after these messages go to the world? I behold and one comes, he's... The Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven is pictured here. So these are the messages that go to the world just before Jesus comes. And by the way, these are the messages going to the world now, not only through our program here, but all over the world. This is taking place. So we're talking about the mark of the beast. We've learned there's two beasts in Revelation 13. What is a beast? What does that mean? Does that mean that there's some monstrosity crawling around the world in the last days? You go online, well, no, I don't recommend you do that. But, you know, if you type in the Antichrist or Beast, they've got all these monsters depicted, you know, these diabolical-looking creatures and demon-possessed people. And it's not like that at all. Let's let the Bible explain itself. What is a beast? We'll go to Daniel 7. Revelation talking about beasts is drawing from where Daniel used these beasts to talk about nations. Daniel 7, 17, these great beasts, which are four, are four kings or kingdoms. The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. So what do beasts represent? We talked about this before. You know, if you say eagle, what country do you think of? United States. If you say dragon, think of what? China. And so uh, we still do that today. The bear is the, the Ruskies in Russia. You look in Daniel 8, 20. The ram that you saw having two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. One of them was the Medo-Persian. The other horn was a little smaller. Was, or the smaller one was Media. The bigger one was uh, Persia. The rough goat, another beast that shows up. He's the king of Greece. All right, so when we talk about the beast in the last day, we're talking about a power, but it's not just a political power. This one is compelling worship. So it is a religio-political power in the last days. How does the Bible identify the beast? It says, I stood upon the sand of the sea. Now look at Revelation 13, notice. And it says, I saw this beast rise up out of the sea. You read in Revelation 17, the sea represents multitudes of peoples and nations. It's a highly populated area of civilization. This beast comes up from a densely populated civilized area where there's multitudes of peoples and nations and tongues. And it says that um, the, the sea is actually kind of stormy. This beast comes up. And what does the beast look like? Having seven heads and ten horns. We saw a beast like that in Daniel. You also see it in Revelation chapter 12. And ten crowns upon its heads. The Roman Empire 
divided into ten kingdoms that were ruled by kings at first. They're not ruled by kings anymore, most of them. And uh, with names of blasphemy. They're blaspheming God. Now the beast I saw was like a leopard. Look at this. This beast is now a composite of Daniel 7. Daniel 7, it says there's a lion, there's a bear, there's a leopard, and then there's this strange nondescript beast. Here, it says leopard, his feet, it says the beast was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion, and it says the dragon is giving him his, poor, his power and authority. Someone said, well, in Daniel, it's lion, bear, leopard, Rome. In this beast, it's looking the other way. It's got the beast, and then it's got the leopard, then it's got the bear, it's got the lion. Why is that? Well, because John, when he has a vision, he's now looking back at the kingdoms. When Daniel had the vision, he was looking forward. So it's actually in the exact order, historically, that the prophet would be viewing them. So those kingdoms, of course, Babylon was the lion, Medo-Persia was his bear, uh, the four-headed leper was Alexander. He died. He had the four generals. So then it gives us, uh, we've got about eight criteria here that are given in this passage that are identifying marks to help find the beast. If I said, all right, you've got to have a secret password for your computer and you only get to pick one digit, your options are how many? If you're using numbers, you get 10 options, zero through nine, one digit, Right? If I say you can use two digits, well, that's greatly increased the different options up to 100. Oh, no, 99. Three digits, your options really increase. When you get up to eight digits, it is very hard for me to guess your password. We are going to find eight criteria that all line up that help us to identify without any doubt what is the beast that's being talked about in these prophecies. All right, so question number five. We're going to look at the different criteria now, so bear with me. This beast arises from the sea. What does the sea or the water symbolize? We read there in Revelation 17, 15. The waters that you saw are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Number six, who gives the beast its power in position? It says, and the dragon gave him his power and a seat and great authority. At Amazing Facts Ministries, we're dedicated to sharing God's last message of mercy across Canada. We're living in a world of uncertainty. Like never before, we need to share God's word to those who know it not. We invite you to join our efforts in this most important work. Through your thoughtful prayer and financial support, we can continue to broadcast our TV programs across Canada you'll receive a tax-deductible receipt for your donations. Call our toll-free number to donate, 1-877-721-3800. It is the support from our viewers which helps make these broadcasts possible. Watch us each week as we share the Word of God that will change your life. We also welcome you to view our website, AmazingFactsMinistries.com where you can donate online or sign up for free Bible study guides 